lot of great businesses aren't quite so great as they used to be. The package good business for the Procter and yeah. Gamble's and so forth of the work, General Mills, they're, they're all weaker than they used to be at their peak. And and, uh, and the auto companies. I mean, when Charlie company, and I were... Oh, my you know, God. Yeah, yeah. When I think of the power of General Motors when I was young and, and what happened, they wiped out all the shareholders. I would no more have predicted that. When I was young, General Motors loomed over the economy like a colossus. It looked totally invincible. Torrents of cash, torrents of everything. And Trying to hold down market share. <laughs> yes, because they, yeah, they were afraid they'd be too monopolistic. And so the world changes and, and we can't change, make a portfolio change every time something is a little less advantaged than it used to be. But you have to be Alert. You have to be thinking all the time in yes. order to whether there's been something that really changes the game in a big way. And, and that's not only true for American Express, that's, that's true for other things we own, including things we own 100% of. Uh, uh, and we'll be wrong sometimes. We'll be late sometimes, we'll be wrong sometimes, but we'll be right sometimes too. And, and, uh, uh, but it's not that we're not cognizant of threats, but assessing the probabilities of those threats being a minor problem or a major problem or a life-threatening problem is, you know, it's a tough game, but that's what makes our job interesting. In my view, there, there is no problem remotely like the problem of what I call CNBC, cyber, nuclear, chemical, and biological uh, attacks uh, that either by Rogue organizations, even possibly individuals, rogue states. I mean, you know, the, if you think about, you can think about a lot of things, and uh, it will happen. Uh, I think we've been both lucky and, frankly, uh, the people have done a very good job in government because government is the real protection on this uh, in not having anything since 1945. We came very, very close during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and I don't know what the odds were, but I do think that if there had been, I can think of many people that if they'd been in the place of either Kennedy or Khrushchev, we would have had a very different result. And it's the ultimate problem. It's, as I put in the annual report, it's the only real threat uh, to Berkshire's economic, uh, external threat to Berkshire's ec economic well-being over time. and. Uh, uh, I just hope when it'll happen, I hope when it happens that that uh, it's minimized, but uh, the desire of psychotics and megalomaniacs and religious fanatics and whatever to do harm on others uh, is a lot more when you have seven billion people on Earth than when you had three billion or so, which is the case when I was born less than three billion, uh, and unfortunately, there are means of doing it. You know, if you were a psychotic back far enough, you threw a stone at the guy in the next cave, and there were a sort of linear relationship of damage to, to uh, psychosis. But the, uh, uh, and that went along, you know, through bows and arrows and spears and cannons and various things, and in 1945, we unleashed something like the world had never seen, and that is a pop gun compared to what can be done now. So there are plenty of people that would like to cause us huge damage. And I came to that view when I was in my 20s, and in terms of my philanthropic efforts, I decided that that was one of two issues that I thought should be the main issue. and I. I got involved with all kinds of things like I mean, the concern union. You supported the, the Pugwash conference no. year after year yeah, after year, frankly, all by yourself. Yeah, the union of concerned scientists. Money to the nuclear threat initiative that is going to create a uh, sort of a federal reserve system, a bank for, to uh, uranium that will take away some of the excuse for countries to develop their own highly enriched uranium. So that, but it's overwhelmingly a governmental problem. I and mean, when you're dealing 
and it should, it should be, and I think it actually has been the top priority for president after president. It's not the thing they can go out and talk about every day, and they don't want to scare the hell out of everybody, and they also don't want to tip people's hands as to what they're doing. But being in the insurance business, well, you don't have to be even be in the insurance business. You can, you, you know that someday somebody will pull off something on a very, very, very big scale uh, that will be harmful. Maybe it'll, the United States is the, probably the most likely place it happens, but it could happen a lot of other places. And that's the one huge disadvantage to, to uh, innovation. I mean, uh, uh, people. Warren, you, I think he also asked, why don't we, Berkshire, spend a lot more time telling the government what it should be doing and thinking? Well, I've, I've tried telling a lot of people. <laughs> it, no, nobody disagrees with you on it. They just, they, it, it seems sort of hopeless to them. I mean, they don't, know, they don't know what to do beyond what they're doing. And incidentally, they've done a lot of things. I mean, it, uh, it, uh, not all gets publicized, but, uh, and I think, I think Kennedy and Khrushchev, I mean, you know, Khrushchev shouldn't have been sending it over to Cuba, but at least he had enough sense when he knew Kennedy meant business to uh, turn the ships around. But it's, you can't count on there being Kennedys and Khrushchevs all the time in charge of things. And, and uh, the mistakes that are made, I see the mistakes that are made in business or human behavior where people act so contrary to their own long-range self-interest that, that humans are very, you know, they've they got a lot of frailties. You know, you can, you can argue that if Hitler hadn't been so anti-Semitic, you know, he could have kept a lot of scientists that might have gotten him to the atomic bomb before we did, but, but he was, he drove out the best of his scientific minds and uh, fortune. Imagine a guy stupid enough to think the way to improve science is to kick out all the Jews. No. <laughs> it was... <laughs> no, the, the hero of the 20th century <clears throat> may have been Leo Szilard. I mean, Leo Szilard is the guy that got Einstein to, to uh, co-sign a letter to Roosevelt and say, you know, one side or the other is going to get this and we better get it first, basically. He said it much more elegantly than that. You can go to the internet and look up the letter, but... but uh, you know, we've, we've both been good and, and we've been lucky, uh, uh, but if you remember post 9-11, uh, people started getting a few envelopes with anthrax and they went to like the National Enquirer and Tom Brokaw and Tom Daschle, I can't remember, uh, I mean, who knows what mind, when, when you're, when you've got a mind that's going to send anthrax to people, you know, how that decision making is made is just totally beyond comprehension. And, and that person did not end up doing a lot of damage, but the capability for damage is absolutely incredible. I don't know how, how Berkshire does anything about that. I don't know how to do it philanthropic. If, if I knew how to do, reduce the probabilities of the CNBC type uh, mass attack, if I knew how to reduce the probability by 5%, all my money would go to that. No question about that, maybe 1%. But hasn't it been true we haven't been very good at getting the government to follow any of our advice? Yeah, but this one's important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. It, you, you, nobody argues with you about it. They just, they just sort of throw up their hands. And, and some people work for a while on it and just get discouraged and quit. They, I, I, was, I was involved, I forget the exact name of it, but their idea was a bunch of nuclear scientists, this is long ago, but their idea was to affect elections in small states, the theory being that government was the main instrument and you would have the maximum impact. And I just one after another, you know, people took it up and got discouraged. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's because we, we've had the wrong leaders that have been good on this. I think, and I think, I think that any candidate uh, well, and I do not worry about the fact that either Clinton or Trump would regard that as the paramount problem of their presidency, but I just don't know. And 
the offense can be ahead of the defense, and and, and that's, that's a, you can win the game 99.99 percent of the time, but but eventually, any anything that has any probability of happening, you know, will happen. I wish I could give you a better answer. Hi, Warren. Hi, Charlie. Hi. I'm Ken Martin. I'm an MBA student from the Tuck School at Dartmouth. My question is about college tuition and the problem of rising student debt balances. In the past, prominent philanthropists have founded institutions that are now prominent research universities in our country. Why is this not a bigger part of today's philanthropic debate, the founding of new colleges? Would not new supply in higher education be at least part of the solution to this problem? Charlie, you want to tackle that one? You're more of an expert than I am. Yeah, I think that if you expect a lot of efficiency, financial efficiency in American higher education, you're howling at the wind. <laughs> well, I, I think he's also talking about just more philanthropy to deliver there. Am I right? Um, or, want to give him the light back on yeah. there? And, yeah, that's right. What's the question again? The question about is maybe whether more philanthropy ought to be devoted to that relatively because of the cost. But well, I do a lot more than Warren does in this field, <laughs> and I'm frequently disappointed. But <laughs> the, the, the monopoly has kind of, and bureaucracy have kind of pernicious effects everywhere, and the universities aren't exempted from it. But of course they are the glory of civilization. And if people want to give more to it, well, I'm all for it. Yeah, it, you know, the, the, you've got the option of very good state schools. And, and uh, uh, you know, we, we spend a lot of money on education in this country. I, you know, if you just take, if you take kindergarten through 12. It's, it's interesting. People talk about entitlements in this country. They say it's terrible. We have all these entitlements for Social Security and everything. We have entitlements for the young. We spend $600 billion a year educating 50 million kids in the public schools between kindergarten and 12th grade. And just think of what that is as an entitlement. Never, nobody ever seems to bring that up. But it's a huge, and I, I believe in it, obviously. But uh, you know, the people in their working ages, generally speaking, I think have an in a rich society have an obligation to both the young and the old. And, and uh, based on the amount we spend, uh, you know, it, 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 if we have problems with our school system, it's not because we're cheap. You know, it, it, there are other problems that contribute to it. In terms of, in terms of the money we put out, we're right up there. But I, I was the trustee of a college that saw the endowment go from $8 million to over a billion. And I didn't see the tuition come down. And I didn't see the number of students go up. Nothing went up, uh, except the professor's salaries. Yeah. From eight million to a billion. I mean, and, and and very very decent people running the place, but when you read the figures on endowment of the big schools, uh, you know, and some of them have really gotten up into big numbers. The main objective of the people running the endowment is to have the endowment grow larger, <laughs> and uh, that will be ever thus. That is the way humans operate. <laughs> You have any more comments on that, Charlie? You've seen a lot. I have made all the enemies I can afford at the moment. Okay. <laughs> That's never slowed them down in the past. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Christian Campos. I'm from New York City. I'm a senior accounting major at Baruch College, part of the City University of New York. And Mr. Buffett, in your annual shareholder letters and during interviews. And even today, your sense of humor always shines through. Where does your sense of humor come from? Please tell us. <laughs> Thank you. 
but it's just the way I see the world. <laughs> I, it, it's, uh, it, it's a very interesting and in times very humorous place. And actually, I, I think uh, Charlie has a better sense of humor than I have, so I'll let him answer where he got his. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you see the world accurately, it's bound to be humorous because it's ridiculous. <laughs>